This presentation from the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association in Huddersfield share their testimony of the liberation of the concentration camps in the spring of 1945. This year is the 75th anniversary of the liberation when the world was brought face to face of the sheer horror of Nazi Germany's attempt to exterminate Europe's Jewish population. Over the next half an hour, survivors of the Shohoa will tell their liberation stories in their own words. That we are going on a march because uh, Americans were coming. These films were made for the Holocaust Exhibition and Learning Center based at the University of Huddersfield. The HSFA would like to thank the survivors of the Shohoa for sharing their most traumatic memories. Eventually, we arrived to a massive big gate, and there it says Bergen, Belgium. So we arrived in Belgium. Now, if we were in a hell hall in Auschwitz or in Dora, the Bergen, Belgium was a hell hall. There were people lying all over the place, because the main camp was absolutely full. So there were about 60,000 prisoners in Belgium and 30,000 perished of typhus. People were just dropping like flies. That's something I will never forget. I witnessed fellow prisoners, what I haven't done myself, taking a jacket or a pair of trousers off of a prisoner who was dead because it would look better than he was wearing. But I, what I did do is going through the pockets looking for a pair of crumb. Bread? The last seven days we didn't get anything. That loaf became eight to a loaf, eight prisoners to a loaf. And sometimes we got nothing at all. The soup was just rotten cabbage and a rotten two little potatoes, if there was any. And that was a rain take. I mean, I became just about five stone in Belgium. And uh, it was January the 18th. We were counted and we were Outside was minus 25 degrees, snow, deep snow, winds blowing, and they took us out on the death march. They took, they cleared the whole Auschwitz out. They just left one hospital. They were going to shoot them all and they had no time. So they had to leave. And we walked for about three days without any food. In the, in the stripe, pyjama, we were freezing, it was so cold, it was terrible, and then we arrived at the station and we were loaded on the station and we were taken to a place called Buchenwald. I would say middle of March 1945, we were assembled, lined up and we were marched to a place called Nordhausen. Here again, the wagons were waiting for us. We were cramped in, the train set off. Every so often, which it must have been prearranged by the SS, the train would pull up and the doors would open and we had to throw the dead bodies out. And there were fellow prisoners outside picking them up, putting it onto carts. The wagon was full when we set off, and I would say two-thirds of them perished on the journey. We knew a day before that we are going on a march because uh, Americans were coming. A wagon train pulls up and we are told to put the patient, people who are ill, to be taken to Bergen-Belsen, the rest of us were to march there. We should 
prepare ourselves, we would get a tin of bully beef, we would get a blanket each, and we would be going to the main camp, Dachau. All those who could walk, we had to march out. I think it was that frightened that the Americans are on the doorstep. And they gave us in our hand, each of us a loaf of bread, a big tin of bully beef, some cheese, and some blankets. And they told us that it is for three days. The night before we left for Dachau, we, we realized that this is the end of the road. All we were hoping that we would stay alive and see the end of our imprisonment. But we, we had our doubts because we realized that the final intention must have been to exterminate us. The prisoners were all collected and lined up in columns of 100 and we marched on. When we started off and they walked us in the night. Sometimes we marched daytime, sometimes at night. I think that was what the German population should know about it and hid us in barns. We noticed as we were marching that we were followed by two Red Cross vans. And we were told that the representatives of the Swiss Cross are keeping an eye on us. So that was something which helped us morally. But later on they disappeared, we never saw them again. So it was a fleeting glimpse of hope. One evening, when we were getting up to start marching again, I couldn't stand because my leg had gone stiff again. People started collapsing. It was a long march. Anybody lagged behind. A soldier detached himself. You heard a shot. And some people were shot on that march. The stragglers were shot. We heard shots. Soldier came back and the person didn't. That happened several times during the night. So we realized if you couldn't keep up, you would be shot. I found out about my mother's death. I was very worried about my mother staying in the ghetto because she was so highly strung and because uh, I didn't think she could cope as well as some people who are less highly strung. And I, I was told that she was in fact magnificent. She rose, she helped people, she shared with them and she was quite strong, which surprised me very pleasantly. But she always said to me in the ghetto, there is always a way out, there's always a way out. You don't have to suffer degradation. And she in the ghetto always wore a belt, a sort of cord round her neck. And she said, you see, just pull that and that's it. They're not going to get me. And in the ghetto, in the Institute of, I understand, that it got to be very cold and very horrible. It was November. And she committed suicide. She hanged herself. And uh, one of the people who was the sister of my wedding, witness, wedding ceremony witness came out and told me about it, that she was there with a group of people who discovered my mother hanging. And somebody said, oh, we must cut her down. And Dina, my friend, said, no, don't do that. She doesn't want that. And she, Dina, my other friend who told me that afterwards, said she and her mother stayed on, of course. And she was there through the typhoid epidemics, through the horrible winter throughout. And her mother died at the end of that in the camp. And she said, you know, I wished my mother hadn't had to live through this last winter. So in a way, however horrible it was, it could have been even worse.
uh, on that day, liberation meant li limitless euphoria. It means forgetting all and everything that happened before for a few days. They were oblivious completely. But on one hand, there was this euphoric happening that we were now no longer under threat. Our lives seemed to be more or less secured and saved. But at what cost? Only then had it hit me that here I am, just over 17, homeless, penniless, a stateless person, an orphan, in a land of the enemy who destroyed my family and myself and millions of others. And I was absolutely naked. It was really slowly and very soon it dawned on us the sort of things that have happened. And that euphoria lasted for quite, quite a few weeks until we came down to earth and we realized that everybody around us perished. If you ask me, who do you think that you survive? I can answer it because I don't know why I survived. And I realized it, that if I want to survive, I have to merge in the crowd. I mustn't be standing out. I had a policy of never to stick out, always to merge in the background. And I was small. I didn't eat as much food as the big fellows. I suffered of scurvy, scabies, you name it. I mean, I still got marks on me, uh, which I never healed up. But at least I survived through a miracle. I think I was young. I was fit at that time. And it's mostly luck. Well, uh, I suppose the simple answer is luck, because there was nothing else uh, to it. We just hang on to life. Always I, I keep thinking, why did I survive? That's, that's in, always in my mind. Why was I the lucky one to survive? What could I have done to help the others who did not survive? I um, found out through, my, through some friends from my town. Only 40 people survived from my town. Everybody was killed. And um, I found out that they were killed in Khelmno, in that forest. Uh, but nobody uh, really of the family has survived. I mean, there were some uh, distant cousins, three times removed type people, yes. Well, I reckon that there were roughly about 52 aunts, uncles, and cousins from both my father and my mother's side. And 12 of us survived, which is a lot, really. There were three and a half million Jews in Poland, and a um, quarter of a million survived. The pleasant thing was that I found out that Three of my cousins were alive against all expectation. They were saved by the dedication of Lithuanian neighbors. I um, found my elder sister two years after the war. Uh, she was in Russia um, during the war. I knew that she went to Russia with my aunt, aunt and uncle. And I found her after the war uh, through the Red Cross. Out of five cousins, I just lost one cousin that was the youngest of us. He had no chance. He was a victim of the big action. So 
that 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 restored a li little bit my uh, confidence and stopped my depression. And of course, the first thing they done they lured you into a bath, and that was, I suppose, the first, not suppose, that was the first bath I had uh, for over a year. Uh, and the next thing, they put you on the weighing machine that we was doing in the hospital, and at that stage I weighed four stones, 56 pounds. We got better, well, not better, but we started to certainly change our outlook on life. We were given the chance of either going back to, call it, homelands, or move into another camp, uh, 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 sort of a, not a concentration camp, but a civilian camp for survivors or what, somewhere in the best until something can be worked out. And at that stage, I still hoped that somebody from the family will have survived. And I went back to Hungary. Now, I didn't want to be in the camp. I didn't think that likely that any of my family would have survived. So since I spoke so many languages, I went to the, uh, which were British military government, and offered my services as an interpreter. They couldn't believe that I could speak so many languages. We were taken to the airport, 40 girls and 260 boys, and um, on 10 bombers, they brought us to the Lake District. Anyhow, they picked me up from the hospital and we went to Buren, where I worked as interpreter to Bert, to whom I eventually got engaged. Me and my friend Moshek, we stopped to, to assess men. And uh, right away they were terrified. One was a captain, one was a sergeant. And they both happened to be French, French origin. Oh, we did nothing to anybody. We were very good. And I said, and uh, we had other thoughts for them. Walking from work and seeing a German POW, prisoner of war, very dilapidated condition, sitting on the ground, not in any camp or anything, just sitting there. I don't, don't know why. We told me you barbarians, you're, hor you're uh, inhuman. Uh, we told them to take the rooks off, off their backs. Yasha, my friend, Yasha Gurevich, twisted a mach machorka is a sort of rough, rough tobacco that you twist into cigarettes, and he made that and he smoked. And the German said, give me a puff, pal. And we let them go off. Uh, terrified they were of us. And Yasha, with absolute disgust, walked away. Gave him. Didn't kick him, actually, but just sort of dismissed it. And I had a big argument with him about that. And then, after something there for a while, uh, some boys, soldiers, German soldier boys, walking past. And one of them, uh, he just walked towards me and he had a, a uh, Hitler used German knife and he gave it to me. He said, they have killed all my family. They have inflicted grief on millions. And you expect me to give him a cigarette? And he never said a word, he just looked at me, handed <laughs> the knife to me. And I just looked at them and he looked me straight in the eyes and he walked off. Well, I didn't see it that way. I said, I have survived and you have survived. To show, surely, that we don't identify any one individual with a group of killers. And we are not like them. And this man is down and out and wanted to smoke. And you didn't give it to him. Um, it gave me a feeling of a young boy, my age, 
and how different things could have been. The first of May, I woke up and I was covered in snow. There weren't any barns to put the hiders in, so there was a freshly ploughed field and they told us to lie down in the field and the German soldiers lay down in the trenches. The next morning, it was about nine, nobody calls for a roll call or anything. Look out through the window and all the German soldiers were sending on a roll call. And there were planes overhead, and there were American planes, and the soldiers were edging their way towards the, the wood. There was no sign of the guards. We seemed to be deserted by everybody. And then we saw a Russian prisoner who told us the guards have, have run away and they're waiting for, for, the, for the Americans. And pretty soon they came into our room, into the barracks, and they said, we are going to leave you here because the Americans are in Wolfratshausen and they should be here in a couple of hours and they will take you over. Bye-bye, they shook hands with us and they left us. Just like that. After a while we heard a rumble in the distance and we went into hiding just in case it was the SS. But then we noticed the tricolor, the French flag was flying, so the shouts, oh, the free French are here. And then along the main road, we saw American tanks coming, and they stopped in the square in front of the field. The American soldiers got out. And they gave us straight away uh, some chocolates, but I wouldn't, I knew I shouldn't have it, I asked, du pain, s'il vous plaît. So he threw half a loaf of bread. That was the euphoria. And my friends lifted me up and carried me to a farmhouse nearby and put me on the wooden settle. And the doctor says, whatever you do, don't have milk, don't have eggs, don't have butter, don't have cheese, because the sort of food we have had had scarred our stomachs and we couldn't actually digest it. And they were so irresponsible by feeding us. And so many prisoners died. They were overeating and the body couldn't take it. We scrounged some potatoes and so on, so we ate and we were, uh, we were just relieved that we are alive. We were taken to a displaced persons camp in Freiman, Munich. And that's where I fell ill. I first saw him whilst I was working. I went in one of these big rooms, and there is this young man lying, and all I could see this pair of brown eyes. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. I couldn't lift my arms. I couldn't lift my legs. And I asked what's the matter with him. And he had some sort of a paralysis, paralyzed from the cold. And I thought nothing about it, and a few weeks after, during the summer, I saw him already in pyjamas. I used to see him, but I didn't think anything about it. I met one of the Hungarian girls who were evacuated from Auschwitz and who arrived in camp number one about a month or two after we arrived. And then... One day he turned up at my room. And uh, later on, when we compared notes, I discovered that we were working next to each other at Moll, at the same workplace for quite a while, and we didn't know each other. And then he came up with some friends. My sister was very pretty and she had all these boys like a, you know, like bees around the, bees around the honeypot. I was very busy 
And they came up and he was with, with them. And that was the first night I really had a long talk to him. Anyway, we established a friendship and we fell in love and we decided that together which we could overcome our traumas and our experiences and it's time to look forward and build a new life. Mm -hmm. And that's what we managed to do. We got married in 1946. In July, first we had a, a civil marriage and in August we had the religious marriage. And that's how I met him. And we embarked for England in October 1948 and indeed we became British citizens. We started a new life and we started a family. That's my lot. Finito. Benito.